from one of your Saiyan buddies? No. Why would you ask me that? That's a franchise I've not loved in a long time. A long time. Yeah, what the hell, it's about time I reviewed these damn things. Hey guys, what's up? It's Big Jack Films here, and welcome to another review. And it's hard to believe in the last 10 years of being on YouTube, I have yet to cover the Star Wars saga. And I gotta be honest in saying that Star Wars was essentially my first real fandom. I was exposed to these movies at a very young age, and they have always been a big part of my life. Hell, I actually can remember the first thing I ever saw that was Star Wars related, and it was a promo for the 1995 THX VHS box set, narrated by none other than legendary voice actor Jim Cummings. For those who remember, 
for those who will never forget, and for a whole new generation who will experience it for the very first time. The original Star Wars trilogy on video, one last time. Yep, that one intro hooked me into exploring this legendary galaxy far, far away, and I've been a fan ever since. And considering Disney's recent years of reviving the franchise, and with the amount of critics jumping in to review the movies, I figured I might as well do the same. But of course, I'm gonna see where it all began with the original Star Wars. But first, I wanna see what you are, my little friend, and where you come from. Wait a minute, the original unaltered version from 1977? That's impossible, even for a computer! I thought these things were a myth that they still existed. Well, if that's the case, I might as well take a look at them and review them as they were originally released. <laughs> what the hell? Jack, Jack, do you copy? Do you copy, please? Come in. Yes, Nick Jackson, what is it? We've got an incoming fleet coming in to Earth's atmosphere. And me and the Ultra Guard can't hold them off for long. We've been totally wiped out. We need some. Oh shit! Nick! 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 Come in! Oh, for the love of Skywalker! Attention all hands, this is Big Jack Films! Prepare to defend and evacuate the studio base! Discs. Guard them well. Keep yourself hidden. A small price to pay for your title. Go! This presence. I felt it before. Jack Buchanan. Lord Vader. I sense much uncertainty in you. Just, uh... A little unexpected to see you here. I see you have plans to review the original Star Wars trilogy. Look, whatever it is, I don't have it. I'm just planning to review the films as they were originally really intended to be. Your plan is as clear as day. A decoy rebel ship captured, while a Skywalker Ranch space station was raided and classified files were stolen and subsequently tracked down to your home planet. No idea what you're talking about. Do not try to resist me, Mr. Buchanan. The original trilogy is no more. Master Lucas has seen to that. The special editions are how he has always envisioned Star Wars to be, and they are all that ever have or ever will exist. Yes, my lord. We have even seen to it your piddling nation's pathetic excuse for a literary archive believes that. Hey, 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 hey! Your fried finger's getting a little close there. I'm having freaking intimate issues with it. For that matter, how the hell are you even still alive? Last time I checked, you killed your boss and made amends with your son. What, did Disney decide to clone you so you can be more marketable? Christ, you're even more of a puppet than Yoda! <laughs> <laughs> Be careful not to choke on your criticisms. What, is David Caruso writing your puns for you now? <laughs> the hour is later than you think. I have come back for a greater task. What else is new? Did your old boss come back with that order of fried lava legs? You will find out soon enough, for I serve a new master now. Lord Vader, we found this 
destroyed in the armory. Good work, Commander. See to it that the bounty hunter hands her over to the hut. Vader! Vader, you vile bastard! She has nothing to do with this! I will foresee to it that she will not be harmed, but to ensure that you review the trilogy properly, she will be under the care of the hut until your task is complete. My new master will meet with you shortly. Guard the facilities. I have a bad feeling about this. Anyway, since I have no other choice, let's take a look at a film that sparked an empire with Star Wars, Episode 4, A New Hope. So Star Wars tells the story of an epic battle between a heroic rebel alliance and an evil galactic empire a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, as the empire is in hot pursuit of a rebel blockade runner. As they board the ship, we find that the beautiful Princess Leia of the planet Alderaan, played by the late Carrie Fisher, transmits a disc of important Imperial plans to the astro-droid R2-D2, played by Kenny Baker, and sends him and his counterpart protocol droid C-3PO, played by Anthony Daniels, off to an escape pod to a desert planet. But the princess and her ship are captured by the evil Dark Lord of the Sith. Darth Vader, played by Hammer Monster performer David Prowse and voiced by James Earl Jones, escorts Princess Leia to be a prisoner of the Death Star, an armored space station with enough power to destroy an entire planet, commanded by the villainous Governor Tarkin, played by Peter Cushing. Weird. I have the strangest sense of deja vu. Meanwhile, on the desert planet Tatooine, the two droids are captured by Jawas and sold to a moisture farm owner. His nephew, Luke Skywalker, played by Mark Hamill, is ordered to clean the droids for the harvest. But Luke finds a hidden holographic message from Princess Leia, who seeks to send the droids to the mysterious Obi-Wan Kenobi, played by Alec Guinness. Obi-Wan then decides to go to Alderaan to help the Rebel Alliance, and takes Luke under his wing to become a legendary Jedi Knight and learn the ways of the Force, a mystical energy field that allowed the Jedi their magical powers. But of course, they need a ship to get to the planet. Looking around the town of Moss Eisley, they meet a fearless smuggling pirate Han Solo, played by Harrison Ford, and his co-pilot Chewbacca, played by Peter Mayhew, and set off for the planet Alderaan, only to come across the Death Star in its place. Pulled over into the battle station, they discovered the captured Princess Leia and decide to rescue her, while Obi-Wan deactivates the tractor beam force field in order to allow the rebels to make a strike on the Death Star. But Obi-Wan comes across his old pupil Darth Vader, and sacrifices himself in order for Luke and the gang to escape. Upon arriving on the rebel base on the planet Yavin 4, they discover a weakness in the Death Star and decide to strike an all-out aerial attack on the station in order to destroy it. You know what? Fuck this 1997 CGI piece of crap! Ah, uh, that's much better. And more practical. Well, it's pretty obvious from the start of this video that not only am I a huge Star Wars fan, but the original 1977 film is one of my favorite films of all time, definitely in the top five. This film for me is the definitive sci-fi movie, and it's got everything you need in one perfect package. Spaceships, alien planets, laser guns, laser swords, space battles, you name it. But with it comes an amazing cast of characters, incredible visual effects and music, and a lot of heart and effort put into making it. So, where did this phenomenal concept come from? Well, it all came from the mind of none other than George Lucas, who is not only my favorite film director, but my personal hero. He created a world and characters that I could really believe in, and that's only half of why he's such an amazing talent. He also revolutionized not only the way films are made with the advancements of technology and marketing, but also showing the strength and power of independent filmmaking. You guys gotta remember that the original Star Wars was, in some respects, an independent film. I mean, yeah, 20 
20th Century Fox produced and financed the damn thing, but before its release, they had absolutely no faith in the project at all, and Lucas showed how revolutionary independent filmmakers can be, so this dude's got major balls that I have massive respect for. But the story and characters of Star Wars are taken from several past mythos and cultures that most would not notice. The biggest influence were that of the old 1930s, 40s, and 50s Saturday matinee serials like Flash Gordon or Buck Rogers, as well as films like The Adventures of Robin Hood, The Wizard of Oz, and even the great films of Akira Kurosawa. Lucas created a mythos from film serials and even old mythologies like Beowulf, King Arthur, and the works of Joseph Campbell, who actually took Lucas under his wing when he was creating Star Wars, and even claimed to say that Lucas was his best student. Speaking of the mythos, let's talk about the cast and characters. First, there's Luke Skywalker, who was always my favorite since I was a kid. I know most kids growing up with Star Wars always wanted to be Han Solo, but I felt like I was the only one who wanted to be Luke Skywalker. I mean, he's kind of the main character of the frickin' movie, and he carries a goddamn lightsaber. What kind of kid didn't want to wave around a laser sword? But aside from the awesome factor, Mark Hamill pulled off a very kind and good-spirited performance as a kid wanting to go on incredible adventures. The only minor downside is that he can be on the whiny side. But I was going into Toshi Station to pick up some power converters. Saw until you didn't have the bad motivator, and I'm never gonna get out of here. There's nothing I can do about it right now. You know, Spyro, shit for that. What a piece of junk. You kidding? The rate they're gaining? <laughs> Shut the fuck up! I always wanted to see Obi-Wan just smack him and tell him to quit it, but Luke does quickly grow a pair of balls and ends up being the adventurous hero we know him for. Why are we still moving towards it? Towards! Then there's the badass himself, Han Solo. And what else is there to say? It's Harrison Ford. It's Han Solo. He's freaking awesome. If you don't think this pirate is the galactic definition of cool, you're as clueless as Greedo's aim. We'll get to that, but Harrison Ford goes all out in his performance as a smart-ass talking gun-smoking bamf. In fact, he wasn't Lucas's first choice since he was more as a stand-in during the auditions. Originally, Lucas considered Kurt Russell of all people to play the part. What's left of it is contaminated. That's it there. Look at those radiation readouts. It's impossible. I've never seen anything like it. The Empire must have gotten here first. The planet has been completely blown away. Eh, don't worry, Kurt. You'll be tackling another set of aliens and weirdos later in the 80s. You die first, get it? Your friends might get me in a rush, but not before I make your head into a canoe. You Where did you dig up that old fossil? But of course, I can't forget to mention the late, great, and beautiful Carrie Fisher as Princess Leia. This intergalactic woman is a feisty and courageous warrior who definitely earned her stripes as one of the greatest female characters in cinema history, and Carrie really fit the part perfectly, and not to mention was a funny personality on set. I'll even admit when she passed away, I cried of the news since I did kind of have a thing for her as a kid. She definitely left us too soon, and she'll always remain one of the great Hollywood actresses and princesses of all time. You're braver than I thought. Nice, come on. But aside from the three leads, there's a lot of great supporting characters. C-3PO and R2-D2 are a one-of-a-kind comic relief and really lighten the movie with some great gags. Anthony Daniels really gave C-3PO a hilarious personality. He's like if the Tin Man and Alfred from Batman had a secret love child with an Oscar. I've just about had enough of you. Not to mention the great Kenny Baker giving R2-D2 a wisecracking but adorable tone. I mean, the guy was pretty much clenched in a trash can on a stand of wheels. It seems pretty bland to give something that much cuteness. In fact, Daniels and Baker really gave their all in performing in those tight metal suits, especially in the baking hot sun of Tunisia. So extra points on that part. I heartily agree with you, sir. And of course, there's the giant walking furball himself, Chewbacca. And yeah, he's pretty damn adorable, but also can be really fierce if provoked. <laughs> Peter Mayhew did a bang up job in portraying the creature, especially given the guy is over seven feet tall. Holy crap, that's amazing. It's first mate on a ship that might suit us. And then of course, there's the wise old wizard, Obi-Wan Kenobi. And I think next to Luke, he's my favorite character. There's so much mystery and wonder with this guy, and you could just feel his presence when his name is mentioned. In fact, he feels it himself in one scene. Obi-Wan Kenobi. Now that's a name I've not heard in a long time. A long time. 
But don't judge this book by his cover, because when it's needed, Obi-Wan will pull out his lightsaber and cut your fucking arm off. <laughs> Damn, dude, he means business. Even when he's fighting his old apprentice, this scene is freaking awesome. And I'll be honest, when he gets killed off, I was as bummed out as Luke was. No! He was like the coolest character, and they kill him off? What the hell? But he does manage to return in the movie in spirit, which is kind of creepy, but doesn't affect probably the most magical moment of the movie. Use the force, Luke. Let go, Luke. Force is strong in this one. Luke, trust me. You know, come to think of it, Obi-Wan reminds me a lot of a certain Jedi-turned-YouTuber that I can't seem to get a grasp on. Jack. 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 Master Rice Duke? You must find me, Jack. In order to defeat the dark side, you must be instructed by me and learn the ways of the Force. But that's impossible! I don't have a ship! Hell, I don't even have a mini Corian account! Ow! Mind your prequel tongue. You will find a ship and a captain in the most likely of places. What the hell is that supposed to mean? Hello? Right, Duke? You just gonna leave me hanging? <sighs> you know, sometimes, guys, the Jedi can be some vague assholes. Oh, speaking of assholes... Of course, all heroes must come face to face with the villains, and most of these guys are pretty damn iconic. First off is the Stormtroopers and the Empire itself. I mean, they're pretty much Nazis in space, but they have some commanding and threatening presence to them. They mean some serious business. Even the Stormtroopers can be pretty intimidating, even though they can't shoot for shit and can be as clumsy as a Gungan. Take over. <laughs> oh my god, that's always gonna be funny. Of course, their commander, Governor Tarkin, is a sinister creature, and this is probably Peter Cushing's best role next to Van Helsing or Dr. Frankenstein, because this dude is not only a menacing and cold-blooded bastard, but he's also really creepy. It reminds me a lot of Cushing's performance in Frankenstein Must Be Destroyed. Charming to the last. But even Tarkin, for all his creep factors, can't prepare you for the bone-chilling, monstrous, most horrifying and iconic villain in motion picture history, which goes to the sinister Darth frickin' Vader. This guy will crush your skull even if you blink at him. Every room he enters, you can feel the evil within. Even though Tarkin is more of a leading threat of the movie and the robot samurai takes orders from him, you can tell that there's more to Vader than meets the eye. A sense of a more powerful threat than the frickin' Death Star, and not only does David Prowse give him a commanding physical stature, but James Earl Jones gives his voice a cold and deadly presence, not to mention the iconic breathing sounds. Don't be too proud of this technological terror you've constructed. The ability to destroy a planet is insignificant next to the power of the Force. Hell, he has a red lightsaber! How much more evil can you get? Well, there is Force choking, of course. I find your lack of faith disturbing. God damn it, I love this guy. One of the greatest baddies of cinema. This will be a day long remembered. I know there's more characters and stories that I'm missing, but so many more Star Wars fans out there can explain it more than I can. So let's move on to the next set of accomplishments this movie has with its design and effects. One of the best things about the movie is the production design, which won the film an Oscar back in 1978. The sets in this movie are amazing from the locations in Tunisia as the desert planet of Tatooine to the massive sound stages in London for the ships and battle stations. While Tatooine looks great on film, it was a pain in the ass to shoot during production. Just four days into shooting, the desert had its first major rainfall in 50 years, which caused the sets and production vehicles to sink into the now wet mudlands. Not to mention the exaggerating hot temperatures. For the cast, crew, and especially Lucas, it must have been really frustrating. But once they started shooting at Elstree Studios in London, it was a lot easier. Even though the budget was getting bigger and the shooting schedule was really behind, the sets from the Millennium Falcon 
Falcon to the crowded Death Star all look fantastic and give a really massive scale to the world. All of the costumes, robots, and aliens walking around make the movie come alive in an incredible fashion. But given this movie is a visual experience, it does contain a shit ton of visual special effects, and after 40 years, they still look really damn impressive. Most notably the spaceships, which were done with models made from cardboard and model kit pieces. This was the first feature film for then newcomers of Industrial Light and Magic, including the talents of stop motion animator Phil Tippett, model maker and future film director Joe Johnston, visual effects compositor Dennis Murin, makeup artist and creature maker Rick Baker, and of course effects cameraman John Dykstra all of which created some of their best work, even when all of it was built and made from scratch in an old warehouse. These effects still hold the test of time and are a real inspiration for young filmmakers to make amazing special effects out of models. But then of course there's the iconic lightsaber, which even today I have no idea how they did it back then, but they still look amazing. We all want this iconic weapon for its power, its awesomeness, and for its sound. Speaking of sound, that job was handed over to Ben Burtt, who with Star Wars has created some of the most iconic sound effects in film history, from the beeps of R2-D2, the hum and clash of the lightsaber, the vocal roars of Chewbacca, the zooming sounds of the blasters, and the menacing breathing of Darth Vader. All of these sounds are legendary, and without them and Ben Burt, the movie would not be as popular as it is today. And of course, there's the legend himself in music, John Williams, whose score, in my opinion, is his best work to date. Half of the movie's tone and history came from his musical talent. Every theme is catchy and iconic, from the main theme... <laughs> to the action-filled rebel theme, the romantic melody of Princess Leia, and even the catchy and somewhat overdone cantina theme. But the best theme personally for me is the Force theme. It's probably one of the most emotional and powerful pieces of music I've ever heard. Rock on, John Williams. Rock on. So you guys have pretty much seen me praise the movie, but is there anything that downplays it? Well, there's one thing, and it sticks out like a sore thumb. See, while I did grow up with these movies on VHS, my first theatrical screening of Star Wars was in 1997 when the special editions arrived in our galaxy. While my first theater experience with these movies was incredible, I was at first impressed by the improved and enhanced special effects and some of the new scenes added to the film. Even owning the first DVD release, I didn't mind them at all. But then I discovered something that most fans realized. The special editions were the only ones that were selling, while the original unaltered prints that originally screened in theaters and won the 1978 Academy Awards, mind you, were permitted to never exist. Even if the special editions are Lucas's definitive visions, which I do respect, why deny the fans the original versions that made these films so iconic? Why forget the model spaceships that inspired so many young filmmakers and give them digital fast moving ships? Why include the scene with the CGI job of the Hut that ruins the suspense of first seeing him in Return of the Jedi? Hell, why does Greedo have to shoot first? Yes, I bet you have. <laughs> If you didn't want Han to be a cold-blooded killer and appealing towards kids, then why did you film it with him shooting first to begin with? Character-wise and visually, this is so stupid and makes no fucking sense! And finally, why have important and suspenseful scenes ruined by CGI shit smeared in front of the camera that can give the asylum a run for its money? God! Fuck, 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 shit, shit! Lucas, why the fuck are you doing this to your movies? Yeah! <sighs> 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 
damn it. I can't. I... going to be one of those fans or critics that dissects these films and everything wrong with them. If you go into movies just looking for things to be angry at, you don't understand what movies are all about. It's a visual art form that is meant to be entertaining, even if it doesn't have the best written or looking characters and a director that has a different spin or tone on the story. And that definitely shouldn't happen with Star Wars. Whether you appreciate the unaltered versions, special editions, or grew up with the prequels, look where it's gotten us in pop culture today. And all of that spun from not only this independent film that could, but from its creator. Without George Lucas, there wouldn't be Star Wars. There wouldn't be Superman the movie or Tim Burton's Batman. There wouldn't be E.T., Jurassic Park, Lord of the Rings, Back to the Future, or even the friggin' Marvel movies of today. And that's the original's biggest plus. The fact that it brought in the franchises we know today for its characters and visuals is practically awe-inspiring. This is why George Lucas is my personal hero. He created one of the first big film franchises that sparked the fuse of what would come, not only from the characters, world, visual effects, and filmmaking, but from a power greater than the Force itself, imagination and creativity. And that's what Star Wars is all about, which is why I'm giving the original film a solid 10 out of 10. The Force is definitely strong with this one. And as pathetically predictable as your return may be, you have failed, my lord. I am a true Star Wars fan, and always will be, just like those who saw the film 40 years ago before me. So be it. If you will not be turned against it, you will be destroyed. Your blade may be powerful, but it cannot contend with the will of the Force. Sand. It's rough and irritating and it gets everywhere. No! Watch a steal the Millennium Falcon or something! 
You stole the Millennium Falcon? There's a weekend rental from Blockbusters, due on Monday. Come on! Oh, is it that a retro reference? Timmy, get us out of here! Wow, looks like you're doing a bit of renovation! Hey, Steve, did you put the parking brake on the Falcon? Well, you can forget about those Imperial slugs. This ship's fast enough to outrun them. What's the matter? You can afford the Falcon, but not a Wookiee? Hey, money talks, kid. And she's still strong enough that she can still put up a fight. So what's the plan, kid? Well, if Rice Duke is any indication, you gotta take me to where he's hiding. With the Empire back in town, the Jedi must be taking extra precautions. Once we group with him, we go rescue 18. You know, you've been with that hunk of metal for so long now. What's that droid carrying that's so blasting important? The negative prints of the unaltered trilogy. Along with a fuck ton of other information I would rather the Empire not finding out about. Plus, with my facility under their control, that's definitely not good for the whole universe. So if you think this is just about money, we're actually in a real shit show. We have Rice Duke's location. But what then? We'll have to make contact with our allies in the Republic. If we're to stand a chance against taking Earth back from the Empire, we're gonna need all the help we can get. In the meantime, I've got a trilogy to finish. <laughs> <laughs>